Thank you. Thank you very, very much. I, I don't know that I've ever had a standing ovation, and certainly not before a single word left my mouth, so thank you. I think we'd all walk around with a skip in our step if we had that opportunity. Uh, may you be just as enthusiastic when my time with this microphone is complete today. Uh, I want to tell you that I'm a little frustrated. I'm frustrated, I'm discouraged, and I'm optimistic. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about my frustration. My frustration stems from about 20 years in the news business. And I believe our fourth estate is in a dire state. Journalists are increasingly overwhelmed, overworked, undervalued, underpaid, and unemployed. It's a serious problem. Newsroom dollars have been dwindling for decades now, but what it's translating to are shrinking newsrooms, which means fewer reports that are important to you ever reaching you. Veteran journalists, so many of my friends, I've seen this happen, they're shown the door. Walk to the door. Out that door goes vast experience, incredible knowledge, and history, and therefore a lot of context that goes with the stories. Uh, this is happening in small newsrooms, in large newsrooms, digital startups, local papers, and huge television corporations. It is a serious problem. Just the first five months of this year, 3,000 journalists just in this country were laid off or offered buyouts. It is in a dire state. Uh, I mentioned the fact that we have shrinking newsrooms. Well, what does that translate to? Communities not being covered. Entire communities lacking coverage. Over the last 15 years, 1,800 newspapers have been wiped off that map, have been wiped off the US map. Nearly half of all U.S. counties have just one newspaper, and it's typically a weekly. 170 counties in this country do not have a single local newspaper. Why is that a problem? Journalists are supposed to be the watchdog for all of us. They're supposed to be keeping an eye on what our lawmakers are doing, what our businesses are doing, what your neighbor's doing, just in case there's something nefarious. If we don't have the watchdogs in place, what happens to our democracy and a free press? Uh, one of the other problems that's popping up and it's not just in newspapers, it's in radio and television, you have fewer journalists doing more and more work. Let's look to a television newsroom. Years ago, there was a concept called a one-man band. That was one person doing a lot of work. It was just in the small newsrooms as you were entering the industry. Well, now it's prevalent in large television newsrooms, in large markets like Atlanta. What does that mean? One reporter drives to a story, shows up, gathers information, does the interviews, uh, captures images, whether still photographs or video, compiles all the information, reviews it, writes it, edits it. Hopefully there's another set of eyes eventually looking at it, presenting the story, and then possibly putting it online and then doing all the social media around it. It's a lot of work for one person. Some checks and balances may not be there. Uh, the other thing that's lost is teamwork and collaboration and perspective. Isn't it wonderful when we all work together and share our thoughts? I believe that's lacking when you have one person working on a story at the scene. So we've got that problem, and then we've got this problem. 2016, fake news was prolific. It was hard to know what you could trust, and unfortunately, the problem is persisting going into the next election cycle. There have been a lot of people trying to create change, but it's such a big problem globally, it's hard to figure out how to tackle it. Facebook, Twitter, you remember this, they were never designed to be news organizations, but they became them. You tweet, you retweet, you post, you repost, you share. And if your really smart aunt or your really trusted friend shares something, you're more apt to believe it. And as I mentioned, it's still a problem. This is from The Guardian just uh, last month. Americans know it's a threat, they know it's a problem, and there's very little we can do about it except just become a more discernible news consumer. Wouldn't it be nice to wake up in the morning and trust what you're reading, to actually believe all the content you're seeing? There is that huge effort underway across the spectrum. Academics, uh, news executives, entrepreneurs, former journalists, or maybe I'm still a journalist, trying to figure out how to solve this current bleak picture of news. Before I tell you a little bit about the solution that we've come up with, that our team has come up with, I want to just tell you a moment, a little more about my career. I've had the pleasure of covering just about every story, and believe me, not every story is pleasurable. It can be emotional, it can be challenging, it can be draining, but I've covered just about everything you can imagine. City council meetings, 
executions, murder trials, uh, ribbon cuttings, groundbreaking ceremonies, graduations, cats in trees, they actually happen, uh, pie eating contests, those happen too, snowstorms, telethons. And then I've had a front row seat to some really cool experiences as well, the ones that people are like, tell me your favorite interview, tell me your favorite experience. Over the course of my career, I've interviewed authors, that's Emily Giffen, uh, athletes, that's an athlete from the dream, uh, well-known actors and actresses and performers. I've had the chance to interview lawmakers and governors, former presidents. I was on the campaign trail in 07 and 08, and I had the honor of being very close to the stage for inauguration of President Barack Obama. Along the way, I've interviewed countless CEOs of international corporations and many entrepreneurs, including some that will go on to become billionaires. That's Jack Dorsey, who founded Twitter and eventually Square. Along the way, I have fulfilled a lifelong dream of mine, working overseas in Hong Kong and Sydney. And then about a year ago, I stepped away from the broadcast studio. Why would I do that? Why would I leave something that had provided me with so many opportunities, taught me so much, and gave me this incredible honor and privilege of telling stories? To tell somebody's story is one of the biggest gifts that anybody could ever have. And I did so because I kind of had to. A lot of change had happened in the business. And I call it a news business because that's what it is. It's become really about the bottom line. I entered the industry when the internet was just really starting to explode and content was available online and it became free. And it became readily available and that became a problem. It changed the entire landscape of the industry. Here's another reason I decided to make a change. My little ones. News is totally rewarding and aflexible. It is typically, a, it's an atypical schedule with zero flexibility. I was going to work at two, getting home close to midtime, or bedtime, I'm, uh, my bedtime, close to midnight. I was missing their bedtime, story time, dinners, daycares close at 6.30, my husband travels every week as an airline pilot, it didn't work. I needed to make a change. So I did that because the industry was forcing me to, I felt, and because I had little ones that I wanted to be around. Just like plywood in its 10th year reimagining itself, I kind of reimagined what could my family life be, what could my career be, and what could the news business be? This business that I dreamed of being in that gave me so much that is so critical to our democracy, and yet something needs to happen, something needs to change. And I think we have some good news coming. There are so many people trying to create a more positive, reliable landscape for quality news. And on the other side of all this reinvention and change, which is uncomfortable, I believe there's, again, something good coming. But how do you fix it? I called it a news business. It is a business. And to fix the business of news, well, we just got to fix the bottom line. To fix the news business, we need to fix the business itself. So how do you do that? There are a lot of ideas. Did you know that there are more than 200 nonprofit news organizations currently in this country? They've popped up over the last 10 years, some of them out of desperation. As some of the newsrooms are shuttering, nonprofit is becoming a very viable option. Uh, Facebook, Twitter, also Craigslist, they're all pitching in with millions of dollars. The billion dollar corporations have been blamed because so much of the ad revenue is going to them. It isn't going to the newspapers, the television stations, the digital websites for the television stations. Remember also the classified ads where people used to put their couch or their car that they no longer wanted? Well, those are gone, right? But everybody started going to Craigslist and Craig Newmark, the founder of Craigslist, has become a real advocate for reliable quality news and a philanthropist. There's actually a journalism school in New York now uh, bearing his name. So a lot of people are trying to create change and this is what our team has done. Led by a former NASA scientist, not me, <laughs> uh, we have created an app that I hope you will try. It's received several accolades. This is something that's really important in the world of apps I would eventually learn as I enter the tech space. Apple called us an app of the day and that makes us really cool. And uh, it's an app you can get in the Apple App Store, Google Play Store, it is free. And I think it offers you a different kind of news consumption experience. Sure, you're going to get the typical feed, 
which is often done by algorithmic surveillance based on what you read and like. So if you like a lot of cat videos, you'll see a lot of cat videos. That's why you keep seeing them in your Facebook feed. But we offer this option, the little map at the bottom that says explore. We want you to have an exploratory approach to news, once again. Take control of the news you're consuming. You want to see what's happening where you grew up? You want to see what's happening where you're taking your next vacation or where you dream of going? Go there. Zoom in on the map. In fact, what it will allow you to do is see a part of the world you've likely never seen. One of the other things it will allow you to do is go very hyper-local. Back to that concept of community, you can go down to the zip code, go down to the street level and see stories that are happening in Syria or in Sri Lanka. And the reason I mention that is, well, you say, I can't read those languages, we're translating it for you. So you will read news you've never seen otherwise. Ground also offers, this is one of my other favorite features, side-by-side -side narratives. Next to each other, you can see news and how the BBC is presenting it, how CNN is presenting it. Fox, MSNBC, your local paper, will show you the local perspective, the national, and the international perspective. That's all free. I've talked about the bottom line. We're about to unveil a uh, subscription service as well. And I can't give you all of the details, but I will say what the subscription will pro uh, provide you with, and it's one of the features, is the opportunity to examine the evolution of a story from the moment it breaks to the current day. Something else that will provide you is the chance to see where there might be some bias. That will come in really handy as we get closer and closer to the presidential election. Uh, I mentioned it's a sus subscription, $4.99, and um, I'll give you my email address at the end if you'd like to email me. I'll happily give you a promo code to use just to get you started, and hopefully you'll be addicted to it, and the promo code will pay off. Uh, but you may be saying, I'm not going to pay for that. Why would I pay for news? Well, guess what? You're already paying for media. A recent Deloitte study says that more than 50% of adults have two digital media subscriptions. By 2020, you'll uh, estimate it to have four of them. And don't forget, your parents, maybe somebody in the room, used to pay for news. I told you I was really happy to be home reading storybooks with my kids again, and this is from Critters. It's a little book where the theme was all that I can be when I grow up. This was 1999, and the little critter says, because uh, this is what he dreams of doing, uh, I have a two-wheeler and a paper route, and I'll make lots of money. No journalist, well, few journalists have ever made a lot of money. This is a job that is obviously no longer there. It's, it's, it's non-existent in terms of going the duration. But I, what I do think is that we need to think outside the box and go back to our roots. Because if you look at the way journalism used to be, we can kind of go back there and hopefully go forward at the same time. Uh, this reminded me of the fact that, yes, we used to pay for news. And while it may no longer be a viable way to deliver the news, we have to all together come up with a viable way to have economic sustainability in the news business. And you may be saying, well, what can I do? How do I take on the Googles, the Facebooks, these gargantuan news corporations? It's very simple. Buy a newspaper. Support your local newspaper. Uh, support a local nonprofit. Just Google INN. It will, it's an organization that's the umbrella organization for all of the independent newspapers that are out there. Subscribe to a news service like Ground. That would be really great. I'd appreciate that. And I know so of my uh, tiny but tenacious team. I think we need to remind ourselves while we want and we need a free press, it is at the heart of our democracy, we have to remember also the researching and writing and presenting all of those stories to the public. That has never been free. And we need to remember that and support journalism and protect our fourth estate. Thank you.